Hello everyone, welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in Matthew chapter 26, and uh, we resume our study in verse 57 today. Matthew 26, verse 57. And we should certainly finish this chapter and hopefully get into chapter 27. I hope you can grab your Bible. As I always say, it's best to have your Bible right in front of you. So you can read the Word of God with me. I use the King James Version, and so I hope you have one. And I think it is by far the best translation is the Word of God preserved for this day. I believe it, because it's based on the best text. Now, while you are getting your Bible, I will tell you, as I always do as well, about the Scripture Verse by Verse website which can be found at the Bible, versebyverse.com. And you can study the Bible in its entirety using my audio Bible commentaries at the Bible, versebyverse.com. Check it out and begin a verse-by-verse study through the whole Bible, would you? It's the best thing that you can do for your soul is study the Word of God. So, with that, let's get into the Bible today, our study, Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, And those who had laid hold on Jesus, remember he was arrested last time in the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples took off running. And it says, Those who had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribe, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. So uh, this bunch, this whole bunch here, was known as the Sanhedrin, okay? They were the equivalent of the Jewish Supreme Court in the area of religion. They were miserable, horrible, wretched sinners. And they were in this place of religious power and authority. And you know, when terrible sinners like this get a taste of power, no matter what the venue might be, they're going to abuse it. They're going to use it for self, not for the good of the people, not to promote righteousness, certainly not to honor God. Their power goes to their head. And instead of using their power to honor God, they do things to serve their own purpose and actually dishonor God in the process, and they don't care. God granted these men power and authority because the Bible says that all power and authority comes from God. So he put them in that, he allowed them to be in that position. But instead of using their position to do good, they have the nerve to put God himself, God the Son, through an illegal trial. You see, that's terrible. Using what God has given them that authority to do something that hideous, yes, it is terrible. And isn't it terrible when you and I use what God has given us to do what is horrible, to do what is sinful, to do what is so disgusting to God. He gives us time. He gives us money. He gives us opportunities. He gives us televisions, radios, computers, you name it, authority. And whenever we use it in any way that is dishonoring to God, we're no different than these people. Verse 58. <clears throat> but Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Peter, like the rest, took off in a panic when Jesus was re- arrested. But Peter came to his senses. He he's, seems like he kind of shook it off. Somewhat, anyway. He must have thought, I must be crazy. What am I doing here? I told Jesus I would stand by him no matter what. He may have been thinking, I've got to go to him. 
I'm scared to death, but I've got to go to him. So there he is. Not exactly with Jesus, but at least in the same zip code. He didn't stand next to Jesus and say, I'm with this man all the way. But at least he was kind of sort of in the same area. And I guess, in a way, you know, the other guys just took off running. So there's nothing to say about that. And I guess, in a way, this is a classic example of trying to walk the spiritual fence. You know? Some people want to belong to Christ because they know deep down that Jesus is the only way to heaven. They want to belong to Christ, but they don't want to be too close because they don't want the world to persecute them as it persecuted Jesus. See? So they try to walk the fence. They want to be a Christian because they know Jesus is the only way to heaven, but they don't want to be too close because they don't want the world to persecute them. That's exactly where Peter was. Exactly. But there is no fence walking. Not really. There is no in-between. If we are not with Jesus all the way 100%, then we are against him. If you are lukewarm, you're against him. If you're holding back truth, if you're holding back holiness, any given moment of your life in order to be popular with the people, you're against Christ. Jesus himself said, If you deny me before men, then I will deny you before my Father which is in heaven. Verse 59. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. They, they couldn't find any legitimate counsel. They couldn't find any legitimate witnesses. So they sought for false ones. These are the religious rulers. The religious leaders decide that Jesus must die. That's their verdict. There's only one problem. They know that he hasn't done anything deserving of death. So what's their solution? Oh, easy solution. Just find some lawyers who would sell their mother for a dollar and have them testify that they witnessed Jesus doing something worthy of death. When a sinful person wants something, that is all the reason that they need to do whatever it takes to get it. Verse 59 and 60. Now the chief priest and the elders and all the consuls sought false witnesses, saw, sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. Well, they just kept looking, didn't they? They were determined they were going to find some liars who would testify in a court of law against Jesus. And many false witnesses came forward, but their testimonies didn't agree. And the, and the Old Testament law, why they bothered following the Old Testament law when it came to this, I have no idea. But the Old Testament law said no one can be put to death apart from having two or three eyewitnesses to his crime. And so they looked like crazy, didn't find anyone whose witnesses or testimonies agreed, so they, had to, they just kept trying. Finally, they found two men who lied the same way. There was a lot of work, and it took time, but their evil effort finally paid off. You know, one reason evil succeeds today is that people who push it try hard and they don't quit. Verse 60 and 61. But found none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. You know, Jesus 
this is a classic example of twisting the word of God for your own selfish reason. Because Jesus did say, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. That's, when he, that's what he said. Destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And when he said that, he was talking about his physical body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He never said that he would destroy any temple. But these liars said, we heard Jesus say that he was going to destroy the holy temple. Well, he never said that. That, that is just a false testimony. That, that's the false testimony that they were looking for. It was just a flat out lie. Threatening to destroy the temple was blasphemy. And blasphemy was a capital crime as far as the Jews were concerned. So the false accusers clearly twisted the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, the religious leaders are not interested in justice. They are not interested in truth. They're only interested in murder. So they let it pass. They knew it was a lie. The witnesses knew they were telling a lie. Everybody knew it was a lie, but they didn't care. They didn't care. Nobody in, nobody in public ever heard Jesus say, I'm going to destroy the holy temple and rebuild it in three days, which would have been blasphemous. Nobody ever heard him say that because he never heard that. He never said it. But again, it didn't matter to the religious leaders. They twisted the words of Jesus to use against him. Don't be surprised if you, as a holy Christian who loves Jesus, have others twist your words. There are those in an attempt to win an argument or discredit you or discredit Jesus or discredit the word of God will add to what you have said or distort your words in some other way. Don't be shocked. When it happens, remember what they did to Jesus. And remember, people still twist the word of God today. The cults do it all the time. False teachers do it all the time. Preachers in so-called evangelical churches, many of them do it all the time. By leaving out certain parts of the word of God. Or changing the definition of God's word or changing the vocabulary of God to soften it for hardcore sinners or lukewarm Christians. They're twisting God's word. Happens all the time. Who do you think's behind that? It's not the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you that. 62. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses say against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. The high priest was getting frustrated with Jesus during this mock trial that he was presiding over. They brought all these false witnesses before the court, telling lies. And the high priest is really frustrated at Jesus because he was not responding to the false witnesses. But Jesus had no response to their lies. Because they were not deceived. If they had been deceived, if they were just simply unlearned, Jesus would have responded and he would have corrected them. But they were liars and they knew they were liars. And the high priest knew they were liars. And the Sanhedrin, the high court, knew they were liars. Everybody knew they were liars. Jesus isn't going to respond to lies when everybody knows they're lies. Why? It doesn't pay to talk to liars. There is more satisfaction and less frustration in talking to a wall than in talking to liars. At least a wall isn't dishonest. It might be a waste of time, but at least 
a wall isn't dishonest. Besides, talking to liars gives them a measure of credibility that they don't deserve. So Jesus wasn't going to respond to it. And it really frustrated the high priest that Jesus wouldn't play along. Look at verse 63 again. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. What a hypocrite. What a filthy, vile, despicable hypocrite. He tried to get Jesus to respond to the false testimony in a way that would be incriminating. But Jesus didn't say anything. So now it's time for plan B. He asked Jesus straight out in front of many witnesses, are you the Christ, the Son of God? Which, by the way, in the minds of those people would be the same as asking, are you God? If you ask somebody if they were the Christ, the Son of God, everybody knew in the Old Testament the Christ, the Messiah, would be God. You get that from the book of Psalms and David. So everybody knew that the Messiah would be God. And calling somebody the Son of God was calling them God in the eyes of these people. So they, that's what everybody knew that the high priest was asking Jesus, are you God? And if Jesus, Jesus answers yes, oh, then the, the false teachers here in the Sanhedrin are thrilled because they can accuse him of blasphemy. So look at verse 64. Jesus said unto him, thou hast said in other words yes sir you said it i am nevertheless i say unto you hereafter shall ye see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven in essence jesus said yes i am god you insist that i tell you whether i'm god or not yes i am he didn't back down that's one question he would answer and then he quoted a scripture that these Jews knew spoke of the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus quoted it and applied it to himself. Henceforth, henceforth, he says, thou shalt, he said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter, shall ye see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Everybody knew that that scripture pointed to God, spoke of God. So Jesus says, yes, I'm God. Then he quoted a scripture that these Jews knew, referred to the Messiah, the Son of God, and he applied it to himself. And Jesus said, you shall see me sitting at the right hand of God. Yes, I'm God, and you're going to see me sitting at the right hand of God. And they knew exactly what Christ was saying. He was saying, I'm the real judge. I'm the real. You guys sitting there pretending to judge me. I'm the real judge. I'm the almighty judge. I'm the eternal judge. That's what he was saying to them. And they knew it. He was saying, I'm God almighty. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm on trial before you today. But someday you're going to be on trial before me. Someday you men will answer to me. That's what he was saying. That's what they knew he was saying. They didn't like it too much. Look at verse 65. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of, eyewitne or of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. The leaders didn't like Jesus. They didn't like him. They were jealous of him. They didn't like him claiming to be God. They didn't like the fact that people thought he was God, even though he talked like God and he did things that only God can do. And he fulfilled all the scripture. The leaders didn't like Jesus, so they charged him with blasphemy for claiming to be God. Their judgment on whether Jesus was God or not was based on the fact that they did not like him. Not on the facts. Not on the basis of the evidence that he himself had shown. Now you show all the evidence in the world that you're God, but we don't care. We don't like you. Therefore, you're not God. That was it. Their sin-infested souls created a God 
in their own image. Their sick little minds created a God who was just like them. They were idolaters. They were not even worshiping the one true God. In words they were, in actions, in attitude, in mind they were not. They were creating, they, they were worshiping a God that they had created in their own image and their own likeness. And so the result, the real God, who just happened to be Jesus Christ, was unacceptable to them. He didn't measure up to the God that they had created. He didn't measure up to the God who was just like them. So he was unacceptable. You know, nothing has changed much. Most people believe in God. I mean, you've got to work really hard to be an atheist today. Most people believe in a God. But if you tell them what the real God says, if you tell them what the real Jesus says about repentance about dying to self, about being a servant, about the depravity of man. And if you tell them what the real Jesus says about the need for Jesus to pay for the sin of man on the cross, most will turn away from Christ just as fast as these men did. They don't want the real Jesus. They don't want the real God. Sinners want a God who fit their lifestyle. They don't want the real Jesus, but that doesn't make any sense. Because you can only go on playing make-believe, worshiping a, a phony God that you have created, one that you like better, that doesn't line up with the Word of God, just like these religious leaders did. And in the end, you die and you go to hell. So what difference does it make? What do you gain by doing something so foolish? See, makes no sense at all. Sinners want a God who fits their lifestyle. They do not want the real Jesus Christ. Verse 66. What think ye? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. You know, he, Jesus would have been worthy of death if he would have been lying when he said that he was God. He would have been worthy of death. But he couldn't help but say, I am God because that's who he is. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. He couldn't help but say he was God. That's who he is. He can't lie. The honesty that compelled Jesus to speak the truth even though it resulted in abuse is the same honesty that makes the written word of God so reliable. When you see the strong dedication Jesus had for the truth here, even though it brought him abuse, he went back down, went, but would not back down from speaking the truth concerning who he was. Even though he knew it was going to result in abuse. When you see his strong dedication to the word of God, it should strengthen your faith in the integrity of God's word, in the integrity of the Bible, and it should embolden you to speak the word of God and support those who do. As opposed to those who entertain. Verse 67. Then they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. You know, God spoke these words 700 years before Jesus was born, and he told Isaiah the prophet to write them down. This is what he said. I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Jesus walked right into this situation knowing that all of that abuse would take place and he would be the victim of it. The Bible says you're a fool if you don't avoid trouble when you see it coming. But you are not a fool if you step in front of a gunman and take a bullet for a friend. And Jesus is no fool to suffer humiliation and death for us. 
so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. He took the bullet for us. He suffered humiliation. He suffered spitting. He suffered abuse and whatever else he's going to suffer coming up as we will see. He took the bullet for us. That's not being a fool. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. Jesus laid down his life for us. Even though sinners had been so unfriendly toward him, all of us have been so unfriendly toward him. He's been the best friend that we have. And the best friend that you have in the world today besides Jesus is somebody who will tell you the truth. There's a whole new category of people in the world today. Not really. Invented by man, though. There is male, there is female, and according to some websites, there is others. There ain't no others. There's male, female, there is no other. But I see a whole lot of people who are trying to be others today. And I say, there is no other, and you are on your way to hell because you are practicing a lifestyle that is sinful and vile and abominable in the eyes of God. And that's what he says in his word. And those who tell you it's perfectly acceptable and don't want to rebuke you over it are not your friends. They're cowards. And they will see you burn in hell. And they will join you if they don't watch it. Because there's something wrong with them if they're not willing to tell you the truth knowing that you're on your way to hell. Verse 67 and 68. Then they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palm of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? They blindfolded Jesus, and then they beat him. They say, Who punished, or who punched you, Jesus? Now, they blindfolded him, and then they punched him, they said, Who punched you? And of course, if Jesus would have said, That punch came from you, George. And that one was from you, Fred. And if it would have came from George and Fred, they would have dropped dead on the spot. And he, he could have told them who threw that last punch. He could have told them who hit him with the upper cross or the upper cut or the right cross with a haymaker or punched him straight in the nose. He could have told them. You know, that was painful. And he could have told them who it was because they said, who punched you? And he could have named them. And he could have given them the date of their birth and the color of their hair. And their height and their weight just to prove that he knew exactly who it was. And they would have dropped dead on the spot from fright. He could have told them who threw that punch, but he didn't. He will tell them later. He will tell them when they are standing before him at the great white throne judgment. He's going to say, you, Fred, you're the one who threw that punch. And that guy's going to melt in terror. Verse 69. Got to move on. Now Peter sat outside in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. Here, here's Peter's golden opportunity, you know that? He blew it last time in the garden when he took off on Christ. And now here's his chance to do what he promised Jesus he would do. Stand by him. Here's Peter's big opportunity to redeem himself after abandoning Christ in the garden when he was rested. He blew that one, but you know he told Jesus that he was going to stand with him, so here's his chance to do it. He's got a second chance. And I hate to do this to you, but we're out of time. I'm sorry. We're going to have to pick it up in verse 70 next time, okay? I hope you join me. We'll pick it up right here, okay? Meanwhile, why don't you go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website and continue studying the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation at your own pace, at your own convenience, using my audio Bible commentaries. Go through the Bible three complete times with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. And please keep in mind that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. 
For 30 plus years, I've depended on individuals like you who love the Word of God. And you can give in a secure method if the Lord leads you at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Just click on the donate button at the top of the front page. Until next time, we'll pick it up in verse 70, I promise. We'll even back up a couple of verses, okay? Next time, here on Scripture Verse by Verse. Until then, Michael Moret, so long, everyone.